Welcome to our second to last artist now. Yes, so uh, semester has gone by fast, at least. Um, next week, uh, Paul Anthony is, is presenting, so please join us for that. Um, that's our final artist now guest for the semester, even though uh, my class rolls on for a couple more weeks, so all of you can come to. It would be a lot of fun. We can talk some art. Um, so yeah, um, I guess we should just move straight into Joseph introducing our guest. Makes sense as a photographer, so shall be a great night. Oh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Joseph Michel. Um, so I have the uh, great pleasure to introduce to you guys Aimé Bobien um, and her work. Um, when I first got here, um, God, it's been almost two years now, um, I was uh, given the opportunity to uh, sort of put a call out for an artist to do the Artist Now Lecture Series, and I looked at my uh, faculty in my area, and Lindsay introduced me virtually to MA's work, and I thank her for that, because it's been quite a pleasure getting to see her work, and even connecting you know, some of the similar mentors we've had um, sort of throughout the, you know, at different points in time, but we've it's a, shared a few different uh, interesting mentors. Before I introduce her, I do want to put a couple little plugs out there. Um, next week is going to be the uh, BFA photo exhibition over at Nettleton's Gallery. Um, there's uh, some flyers out there, announcements, uh, like them on Facebook, the show is Sinusher, um, and it's going to be on the 18th from 6 to 9. Following that, on the 25th, um, on Gallery Night, Gallery M at the Intercontinental will be the first annual jury show from Focus. Um, and then, on May 2nd, more photo for you, is going to be a show from a collaborative class at John Horvath and Bob Smith are teaching with the, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we've had uh, photographers from Magnum descend upon and are descending upon uh, Milwaukee right now to do a project called Postcards from America. And the students in that class are assisting those photographers and they are putting on their own show, which is going to be over at the Hyde House on May 2nd, and more to come about that. So if you don't have anything to do, I mean, by the way, an MFA2 show coming up, which is also featuring you know, a number of artists, but also some photography as well. So photo, 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 photo. Um, all right, without any further ado, I want to introduce you guys to M.A. Bobien is an artist and an adjunct associate professor at the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago, where she received both her MFA and BFA. Her photo-based collage work has been exhibited in Spain, Germany, Italy, and throughout the United States, specifically at the Marvell Gallery in New York, and the Rome Hoffman Gallery, and the Carl Hammer Gallery in Chicago. She has been reviewed in publications that include Art in America, Art on Paper, and Art Papers. M.A. has presented her work as a panelist of the Society for Photographic Education, as well as diverse academic institutions, include Maryland Institute College of Art, University of, of Colorado, University of the South, Oberlin College, uh, University of Illinois, DePaul University, and Columbia College. M.A. is a photographic artist who uses and explores the photographic image in new ways. She creates sculptural interpretations and repurposes family photographs so that they take on a new incarnation. In her words, she basically draws with scissors and has described her photo, her photo collages as destruction and construction, a simultaneous collapsing of time, space, and place. Without any further ado, M.A. Bobina. Okay. Same title that um, I gave to this lecture, Always Wherever. 
So sampling and mixing are woven throughout our daily lives and our daily experiences. Cut-up techniques are used in literature, music, cinema, visual art, and popular culture. My lecture plays like a remix as I move back and forth, experimenting with rhythms, patterns, and relationships between different time periods in my production. I take photographs. I make prints. And from my prints, I continue to make things, using photographs to construct pictures. In my working pro process, I reconfigure the subject matter while reworking the images. The physicality of my constructions are comprised of partial views. Photography pictures the world in beguiling fragments. I make the physical scenes visible where fragments meet and overlap. These disruptions function as reminders of the constructed world. I veer away from, from presenting one single static position and away from one fixed point of view. In my work, I explore alternatives to the authority of the decisive moment in favor of conjuring forms that are a synthesis of multiple realities existing simultaneously. Unfettered attachments was made from photographs that I took during a summer residency near Vienna. I spent the summer traveling with my camera, collecting raw material. Originally, I set out to simply document exhibitions to share with students. And then my focus shifted as I was drawn closer to intersecting patterns. Here are five of the primary images from a collection of about nine photographs that I've cut up, turned around, and spliced together. I take scissors to my photographs and take apart images while building new ones. My work shifts from pictures of things to things comprised of pictures. This is a relatively new way of working for me in color and with images that I've captured outside of my studio. Uh, this is a partial view of that same solo show in Atlanta. I've cut by hand all of the photographic pieces and parts that I then bring back together to make a new whole. The physical layers of my hand cut and woven photographs are prominent features when you're viewing them in person. The entirety of each whole embraces the many fragments. Photography records surfaces and delivers select information. Any completeness represented in my carefully composed photographic window onto the world is deliberately obstructed and reshaped. Larger scale pieces are constructed out of many joined together pigment prints that hover just off the wall. I use magnets to attach the photos to screws that stick out by about two inches. So this, you can kind of see the, um, the angle of it in this image. I've always experimented with the physical presentation of my photographs. This is closer to where I started. Exposed is a book that I glued into an extension that permanently holds the book open. The woman's body lines up with the spine of the book on a small shelf for display. The word choice plays with the very nature of exposing light to light-sensitive materials, while suggesting more complicated process of how and what subject matter is exposed. The word breaks down. The figure is held in a pose. The gesture of the hands conceal while they also state. X marks a spot while fingers touch in the gutter. What is really being exposed? During this particular time, I often experimented with a sculptural form of books, testing their ability to suggest private viewings. Books also provided an obvious stage to perform the reading of photographs. The body is still present in my current work, even when I'm not performing in front of the camera. I photograph curtains visible through the windows of an after-hours bar in my neighborhood. The windows caught my attention because they reminded me of sleepy but ever-watchful eyes. One image becomes the starting point, and then I build picture relationships while drawing connections between wildly different scenes. Often, there are pictures inside of pictures and shapes that I reformulate. 
I experiment with the flexibility of images. Things are seldom what they seem. I manipulate my photographs into becoming a series of moving parts, pushing their capacity to change and to transform. The body is impossible for me to ignore. It informs my decision making while also appearing in the labor of my handwork. Photography is always changing. I was a young art student when the pictures generation charted another direction for photography and for artists using photography. When I saw Louise Lowler's paperweights in an exhibition, I was immediately drawn to an unexpected performance of her photographs as objects. She had converted her photos of a private art consumer's collection into collectible souvenirs. The paperweights distorted the photograph. It felt similar to looking through a peephole, suggesting surveillance and also voyeurism. In an essay titled The Sights of Art, Photographing the In-Between, Johannes Meinhardt discusses how Lauer uses photography to dislodge and relocate the framework. She destroys the boundaries of the work of art in favor of the photographed situation. These eyeballs present a curious, averted gaze. Globes made from <laughs> eyes create an eerie doubling and quadrupling, drawing attention to a changing shape of looking, an outward viewing of eyes, looking into the periphery. This looking is happening at the perimeter while also creating a border out of the staring. And what I'm looking at is always being rearranged. <coughs> Different seeing areas in the brain map the scene, stringing together movement, color, depth, and shape to organize an impression informed by the many observed parts. Here, I made pink, puffy legs to surround a spyglass view of the sun setting on a distant body of water. I cut the circular image out from a found photograph that I'd inherited in an archive of vernacular photographs dating from 1914 to 1988. The collection can contains many types of print formats and surfaces that represent different technologies introduced over the years. Charlotte Cotton wrote, there's a rich heritage of artists assembling found photographs. Tacita Dean does something that is very rare she makes a departure within the genre. Flo silently eulogizes upon analog photography's magic and random weirdness, the physical sensation of the photographic snap. So this is just documentation of the book that Tacita Dean made. Again from Charlotte Cotton. The artistic force of Flo is bound up in this particular moment when we can still just tell the difference between what we discard with these fragile traces of a richly incoherent and disappearing technology and the seamless correction of digital media. These portraits, holiday snapshots, documents of banal occurrences, or spectacular views have all been retrieved and given a new existence within the bound pages of flow. I discovered this potent memory from my childhood. I'd originally encountered this modified body when it was casually attached to the front of a refrigerator. My great-grandmother lightheartedly taped her face onto the body of a plus-size model advertising control top pantyhose. The medium of photography is remarkably flexible and at the service of many different purposes. Here she uses a ballpoint pen it was effective enough to make the obstructed left foot more whole when the model was cut out from its, um, its commercial environment. This charged self-image on the left was effectively designed to exert some control over her desires. And she seemed satisfied enough to blend the attachment of her head to this foreign body with a red pen in order to address her own body image. That image continues to linger in my imagination, 
as I actively engage with restructuring picture relationships between multiple photographs. This is from a period when I produced work in, con in conjunction with appropriated photos for the very first time. My limbs reach out of ranch homes documented during a post-war boom. And these were are particularly photographs that my great-grandmother had taken as well. So they were charged in a different way. Um, I let the color cast of an old photo inform the color direction in the photographs that I made of my outstretched arms and legs. I did this while contemplating the hybrid homes constructed by Louise Bourgeois, exploring the model house, the model housewife. I came to study at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I now teach. <coughs> because the photo department was known for having an experimental approach to the medium of photography. This was encouraged by professors like Ken Josephson, who photographed pictures inside of pictures. And Joyce Namanis, who experiments with pop culture, histories of representation, photographic material, and form. And Barbara Crane, who searches for form and emotional content, moving in and out, capturing gestures that are never as simple as they appear. Ken, Joy, and Barbara have consistently worked with photography in innovative ways throughout their careers, and SEIC continues to build a diverse history of production from their legacy. SAIC was also the only interdisciplinary program that I knew of in the early 1990s, so I returned to go to grad school there. In my grad school studio, I crudely assembled representations of the body. These prints were large and rough, and the surfaces pulled away from the wall in relief. I naively tried to figure out some way to redirect the gaze by painting slogans all over my body to perform in front of the camera in an effort to exercise some kind of control over the way the work in these bodies could be read. This is actually a portrait that um, one of uh, my undergrad students that I, in a class that I was TAing took of me in my studio. It was kind of like creating like a whole body of work um, of portraits of artists in their studios. I continue to reassemble the body, driven by a restless relationship to representation. Here, I've cut and combined my photographs with appropriated snaps, puzzling together different types of images from views of nature, architecture, and portraiture, in monochrome and in color. Bodies defy gravity in multi-generational patterns. Chains of complicated uh, interactions shift from subtle to extreme changes throughout the networks of these spliced together elements. Often images have captions written on the back, and sometimes that information indicates what is absent in the image. I think about who is in front of the camera, who is behind the camera, what is in the frame, what could be just outside of the shot, and what might lie beneath the photo. During grad school, I would move straight from the dark room to the studio with wet prints. I quickly glued these large, loosely tiled photos together to let them dry and curl in a space that I shared with a fellow graduate student. One day, a school security guard tried to stop me from entering our studio space because he had a hard time believing that this was really my studio. This came as a complete shock because I didn't really understand why I was being asked to prove that it was my own workspace. Later, I learned that school guards were hanging out with my studio mate <coughs> to view my artwork. He let them believe these were his photographs of his girlfriend in an effort to prove the failure of my intentions. While I was attempting to alter the way that my pictured body was read, I learned that I could not completely control the reading, especially when I couldn't control the context. What I really wanted to know was if the security guard felt motivated to protect me, my studio mate, the images, or his continued access to the images. 
The text in this piece reads, tickling your ferocious fervor to impress your bristling torch. I also wanted to know if anything might have changed if he knew a woman made the work. This work was a way for me to explore my relationship to representations of the body. I used my skin as a printed page to comment on the performance of female figures in visual images. A friend described a Kiki Smith sculpture of a woman crawling on all fours, leaking entrails across the gallery. I was also reading Geek Love, a novel about a fictional family purposefully ingesting experimental drugs and chemicals to genetically alter their offspring in order to create their own traveling freak show. <coughs> These combined experiences led me to exploiting the possibilities of reorganizing the body using photomontage techniques to facilitate contortions and distortions. I made mistake long before seeing Smith's tale. The experience of delayed gratification was far more common before the internet. I appreciated discovering her wordplay, which had been lost in the first description, but recovered after I finally found documentation of this installation. Montage techniques render something seamlessly legible while collages about interrupting any seamlessness to make something less legible, turning oneself, devouring oneself, the seams disturb the surface of photographs, pointing to where the printed page overlaps and interrupts illusions. The seams break the frame and confirm that the image has been constructed. John Stesiger said he's interested in concealment, directing attention to what cannot be seen, the power of the unseen, the threat of the unknown. He manages to make 40 years of decisions look effortless. In an interview, Stesiger said the matching of images in his marriage series are to do with the fact that the images do not marry because when they do not marry, the beholder has to participate in creating the marriage. And in a series of postcard inserts, the postcard rests on top of the photograph while referring to the space behind. Stetziger says, when associated with a, a face, these behind spaces refer to the process of looking out as well as through. The face is emptied of faceness and reduced to a shell. I fought some embarrassment negotiating these cliches, but you have to start somewhere. So here I am, another woman, making work with family snapshots along the familiar terrain of appropriating vernacular imagery. My first efforts were obvious gestures as I began gathering experiences working with this collection of conventional photographs. Direct reference is made to the eyes that have been removed. Sometimes my mark making <coughs> radiates out with a sense of humor. This is another installation from uh, the exhibition Always Wherever. Physical gaps repeatedly break through the surface of my photographic constructions. Here, I looked through my midsection and bottom, riffing on the apertures that light passes through in optical instruments. I actively resist the precondition that photographs are bound to common rectilinear aspect ratios. I layered a series of square prints to create a gap in the middle that could reference the opening inside of a lens. John Stetziger has said, there is something very odd, even unnerving, about cutting through a photograph. It sometimes feels like I'm cutting through flesh. Often I slice into representations of the body. Every time I use my scissors and mat knife, I adjust to the violence of cutting. For me, the cutting essentially begins before my prints are even made. 
When I lift a camera to selectively record, something is inevitably cut out of the frame. Orb transforms mooning butt cheeks into a moon-like form. I oscillate between what I've photographed and what the form suggests. What is pictured is only a suggestion, a trace of surfaces. While I rework these surfaces, I adjust to the projected sureness of the record by keeping the signs of my adjustment visibly intact. <coughs> This small photo from the 1940s is combined with gouache painted onto black paper within an excised hole. I painted with a tiny spot toning brush that I'd once used to get rid of dust spots in my silver gelatin prints. Holes are reoccurring characters in my work. The hole is an opening demarcating inside from outside and public from private. These boundaries are persistent preoccupations. <coughs> this piece was the starting point of a new way of working for me that did not have to exclusively depend on assembling photographs of the body. I discovered a way to use my photographs of the outside world after cutting up and destroying so many appropriated views of someone else's outside world. I looked to my snapshots that I've always made with a new purpose and constructed a fortress out of the architecture that I snapped during walks through my old neighborhood. Then I stacked it with intersecting and rotating vintage panoramas to create a series of openings. Working with my photographs from my everyday is a direct outgrowth of cutting into an appropriated archive. The primary subject matter, conventionally located in the center of many images, has been cut out and replaced with a painted impression shaped by the pretense of remembrance. Soft, fuzzy leaves surround a delicate raster-like pattern resembling psychedelic cross-stitch embroidery, informed by the record remaining in the peripheral environment. So many tiny memories branch out over the years, forevermore. This was built around a collection of captured observations of trees changing throughout the seasons. I move in and out of the frame, shifting from behind the camera to in front of the lens, as well as looking through the viewfinder at distorted extensions of myself. In the end, all of these complicated layers are carefully taped together on the hidden side. During gallery talks, I learned that many people had assumed that I worked from a found encyclopedia of body parts, unaware that I actually generate unique photographs to cut into for each new piece. I repurpose my own photographs. I capture images with the intention of putting together compound images. The convoluted manufac manufacturing of compositing images feels closer to my experiences in the act of looking at a subject while in the process of photographing and looking at the subject through the prints as I'm piecing things together. So the top row is just a collection of Xeraxes that I just very crudely made of my contact sheets and slapped them together. And then the bottom row is um, some of the more uh, finished collages. <coughs> Postures of delirium reconfigured into climbing bitterness. On the right is an installation view from a huge group show Lisa Wainwright curated entitled Ah Decadence. From Lisa's catalog <coughs> essay, the exhibition speaks to the disintegrating effect of time, but the liberating efforts of an artistic imagination not bound to social norms, traditional <coughs> values, and strict academic conventions. Chicago decadence foregrounds sensuality and eroticism, both in subject and in style. This is deeply romantic work, where life and death and consciousness of that predicament is felt through extravagantly rich art making. I asked a man to shove parts of his body through various openings cut into a bare wall. 
I photographically examined the fragments protruding through these glory walls. <laughs> the aggressive nature of this intrusion through the portals is absurdly deflated by picturing an array of so many feeble attempts. I couldn't resist a series of penetrations. <laughs> Um, inside an entrance that beckons and a void that threatens, I look for openings between what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. In this, in this exercise, I had a friend shove their elbow into my mouth to see how wide I could open my mouth. It was painful. And what I'm looking at is always being rearranged. I continue to experiment with how much I can take away and weave together while reorganizing competing pathways to follow through these fabricated experiences. While reading Marquis de Sade, Bataille, Sakar Masuk, Kathy Acker, Dennis Cooper, I made pieces like this. The letter I chose as shackles might in bondage. Trust leads between her legs and slavery breaks down on a free-falling figure. Around this time, I was also a guest panelist on a TV talk show when the topic of the day was censorship issues in the arts. Many audience members uh, labeled each of us pervert, pervert, pervert. And then when they got to me, the only woman on the panel, they called me the pervert who needed a boyfriend. <laughs> Guards had to like, escort me off the stage. They were worried about my well-being. The experience was actually a useful reminder that sometimes it can be difficult to separate the message from the maker. Whenever I showed my photo professor my work during undergraduate studies, he would turn my collages over and tell me that the reverse side should not be ignored. I remained mindful of the effort revealed in the back side. And I appreciate discovering the incidental gestures that support the appearance on the front. You really don't see all the labor unless you see the backside. I recognize patterns in the, in the things that I photograph. I look with photography. For me, a still image is never really as static and frozen as it may appear. The column of images on the right-hand side are some of my early influences. They demonstrated to me the mutability of photography. And through them, I learned that a line photograph is capable of powerful suggestions. Openings are navigated daily. Holes, apertures, and gaps can embody some of my deepest fears and potent fantasies. Attention is drawn to the contrast between the fixed frame of the photographic borders and the mark making contained within. The painted and drawn lines embellish and obstruct the depicted moment. I have reordered the iterations of available fictions to moderate the experience and speed of recognition. I built up heavily painted layers in the openings generating another site of potential transformations. I create collections of printed images to work with, piecing together picture relationships while also experimenting with the combinations of conflicting materials. Before cutting up appropriated photographs, I transcribe any available captions written on the reverse side. I've cut and rearranged some of the phrases to generate titles for individual pieces in this body of work, employing the cut-up writing techniques used by William S. Burroughs and traced back to Dada's in the 1920s. So I spent years photographing in my studio. The text on my body uh, reads, you could drown in such beauty, and the text the other side reads, let's fuck. And that text is just vinyl letters that I put on my, um, my wrist, or my fingers. <coughs> For a while, I converted photographic forms into patterns. And in these images, I was 
was really thinking a lot about um, photographers like Hans Bommer. It seems obvious when you see the work. And then sometime joining my photographs with appropriations. <coughs> this was followed by reconstituting tiny photographic scraps in combinations with my mark banking. And now I'm deliberately using candid records from my life as raw material to rework. This transition in my working process has in turn changed the way that I capture moments from my everyday. How much can I cut away? What will agitate associations? Where does meaning appear on the surface of things captured? Can my manufactured disruptions alter the sensation of reading a photograph? Patterns camouflage, distract, and provide opportunities to discover paths through puzzling visual systems. While the scale has increased again in my current work, some of the cut shapes are directly related to the painted and drawn gestures that I've been doing in conjunction with the very small snapshots. Directed by experience, feeling, thought, and confusion between the focus on the line and the focus on the edge and the field of focus presented in the photo. I construct collisions between abstraction and what is made present in the photograph and what is made absent through the acts of incising and extracting. In recent exhibitions, I've been attaching my work directly to the wall. I'm drawn to the physical attributes of a printed photograph as it exists in a three-dimensional space. I make marks with the way that I cut into my photographs, drawings, drawing with scissors. I present tangles of visual information, playing with our ability to simultaneously entertain multiple narratives and multiple points of view. Here, I specifically cut up a collection of still lifes of produce bought at the farmer's market, local landscapes in a nearby park, and views through my neighborhood shop windows. With just a few visual suggestions, my mind fills in the gaps. Moments drift. I draw connections in and out and through different conditions moving in a manner that I imagine information that's traveling through systems and bodies. The act of replacing a complete image in the process of inventing a new one seems analogous to the way that I process information and reconstruct memories. I think I know something, but that thing and my relationship to it continues to transform. Subjects are veiled, environments are turned upside down, cut open and apart. I play with the incongruities between the photographic impressions combined with the implied order in the painted systems. I put things together and tear them apart in a performance of revision. This is just documentation of me putting this piece together. And I would like to do more of these little gifts, animated gifts, but I found that I was um, very distracted by the documentation, that I kind of got in the way of making the collage. So I'm going to try again. Um, I vacillate between producing connected moments and making active gestures that extend the mark making across the field, creating turbulent conditions. That may sound overly dramatic, but my intention is to share with you how in the making, I travel through illusionistic planes to create these tangles, knots, and webs. A 
and they weave an emotive fabric together. Propelled by the provocative nature of the push and pull between recognition and abstraction. I feel openings, rewriting moments, and reworking experiences, as is often the case in the act of recollecting. Patterns provide opportunities for the eye to continue moving over and under and around the many layers of images. I react with my camera, like many, to what I see. And like many, I respond to the quality of light. And I react to colors, textures, and patterns available in the world. Chains of interaction shift from subtle to extreme throughout the topography of these spliced together elements. My treatment of the materials exaggerates the uniqueness of these individual pieces in a medium that is associated with infinite reproducibility. Each one of these is a unique one-of-a-kind piece. Many of these older photographic processes and surfaces I've worked with can only be approximated with current technologies. This is one of my latest um, preoccupations. I uh, recently purchased this catalog that is phenomenal. It's um, called Emily Dickinson's The Gorgeous Nothing. And um, her words in these pieces read as follows. As there are apartments in our own minds, that which we never enter without apology, we should respect the seals of others. To the light and then return. And there's a fabulous short preface by the poet Susan Howe, who was also incredibly influenced by Emily Dickinson's work. She wrote, does form envelop everything? Can a thought hear itself see? This is a detail showing different photographed locations that have been cut up and woven into a series of intersecting lines. I have put things together with photographs because they are charged with the specificity of a captured moment that we associate <coughs> with the medium even when it's an ambiguous specificity. Again, this is a selection of Emily Dickinson's um, ephemera. So she would write these poems on scraps of paper and on, the, on envelopes. So um, this is a, from a short essay by Marta Werner, who was uh, one of the people that organized this um, fabulous catalog. And um, the essay that she wrote is titled Itineraries of Escape, Emily Dickinson's in Envelope Poems. One of the 19th century words for envelope was cover. And envelopes are metaphors of containment, of exteriority and interiority, of enfolding and exposure. In Dickinson's case, however, the sovereign force of the envelopes addresses with their promise of exclusivity is ultimately countered by the poem's openness to a mul multiplicity of recipients, an array of futures. The inaudible whirring of the envelope is part of the message they are sending. Slit open, unfolded, written across, and handed over to chance, they reject the asylum offered by the lyric to probe the last privacies of our existence. And I think I read somewhere that she wanted to, to destroy all of this ephemera. Luckily, someone preserved it. The improving technology of compact cameras continue to make it ever easier to capture moments from our everyday routine. Currently, I feel challenged to use records of my everyday life as my primary archive to cut into. I interact with familiar photographic observations and push them into something that is less familiar, <coughs> forward or backward, reaching or touching.
touching, <coughs> pulling between, in and out. I create visual systems for internalizing the outside world. I reanimate snapshots of Frida Duff and, re and revise Acapulco. The current conditions I work through are comp compilations of intersecting information. While the individual photographic components may be easily reproduced, I would never bring things together in exactly the same way twice. I take whatever I have pointed to with my camera and convert it into tangled inventions that overlap and intersect, upending expectations of foreground, background, object, subject, and motion. I circumvent the decisive moment to recombine photographs and take advantage of opportunities to collapse time, space, place, and subject. While photography offers a window on the world, I continue to change the shape of my window. So that is all I have for you. Thank you. to, you know, like, 
figure out where the criticism is coming from, and is it their stuff or is it your stuff, and if they're like repeated concerns that keep coming up, figure out how you can address it. But don't don't give up. Thank you. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Um, I would imagine a lot of people who use digital, they uh -huh. usually just keep it on their computer. Yeah. But I'd imagine that you like print out a lot. I do. And so I would want to know how you store the work that you create and yeah. how you store the extra. Oh yeah. Good question. That's a that's a really good question. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a really traumatizing story. Um, last year, the very last day of the semester, I'm in critique and I'm like so excited because I'm going to go home and I'm going to clean my studio and then I'm going to have like a full month of winter break to work on my own work. And when I got home, um, someone had broken into my studio and stolen my, all my computer, my computer, all my hard drives, all of my cameras. I mean, I just lost 10, 10 years worth of work like in one day. Um, and it was shocking. So what I highly recommend to all of you is um, to back up. And to, I, I was living in this, I never, like I always thought about um, hard drive failure, but I never thought about that. I never kind of like calculated that into the equation. Because I never thought anybody would steal a you know, $100 hard drive. But it was just so convenient. I made everything so convenient for the thieves. So um, now what I'm doing is um, I have uh, external hard drives that I hide in two different parts of my house. Um, I'm not going to say where. Um, <laughs> and then I also am backing up to the cloud. So the cloud, that's a very slow process, but that's my, that's like if anyone ever steals my shit again, you know, like I know that it's somewhere. Uh, because it, it's such a disarming, I, I teach so all of my lectures were taken, like I had to totally start over. So um, what, I'm, what I do though, when I'm working on my work, when it's actually productive, is um, I make lots and lots of prints. And um, basically I just make, I, I make huge piles of prints and then I lay things out on this giant work table that I have. And then I start kind of like figuring out what are some interesting picture relationships that I can start building. And then I make piles, and then I take one pile, and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm gonna work with today. And then I just start kind of like going at it. So, but I do, like I think it's really important to just, you know, I, like I try to forget how much ink costs when like <laughs> deep work. <laughs> no, seriously, it's so bloody expensive. <coughs> but I just try to forget. earlier work that's uh, linked to your body and then mm -hmm. this newer work is mm -hmm. the is there like this intestinal element in the new work or is that uh, oh no it's totally there intestinal <laughs> like, like internal i'm always trying to figure out how to get inside totally and honestly i mean i, I i'm going to admit something that i don't like to i don't i'm not going to show you the image but um one of my TAs, I, I've become very close to one of my TAs, and said so I photographed two births, two of her children were born, and I, um, but I had like, okay, first of all, if you ever get invited to see someone like birth, like yes, say just say yes, and blindly go in. Um, I was prepared the second time, I was not prepared the first time. Um, totally didn't even think about the smells. Um, <laughs> like, really didn't think about any of that stuff. Totally fascinating. But um, I was completely distracted by her placenta. Like I totally forgot about mother and child once I saw the placenta. And so I just like photographed it like crazy. And the second time, the midwife was really interested in my enthusiasm for the placenta. So she started like giving me this whole tutorial about it and holding it up and like really like a, like a great assistant actually, a really great stylist. So um, in one of these pieces, there's a whole bunch of placenta. So yes, and that's the only time where I've actually photographed an organ, and um, I would do it again. <laughs> oh. um, but yeah, like I'm, I'm totally like trying to figure out how to get inside of the body. So, oh God, when I was in grad school, I did this one project where I bought a whole bunch of um, fruits and vegetables, and I, I took a drill and I drilled these holes into it, and then I put like hair around the edges because I wanted to make like my own pubic areas. And, oh, <laughs> but I mean, you've got to like make a lot of bad work before you make the paper. <laughs>
<laughs> but I was trying to figure out, like, how can I photograph these holes? You know, how can I get in there? Maybe I had, like I need I need access to a surgeon so that I can get those photos in tunnel camera. That'd be awesome. Like Mona Hatoum actually did that. Has anyone seen that video piece? Totally fucking blew my mind. So it's like it's one of those microscopic, I don't know what it is, orthoscopic cameras. And so she borrowed it from um, from a doctor, and you can just it's like close-ups like going around different parts of her body, and then it shoots into an orifice, and you don't really know. It's like so abstract, you don't really know where you are and where you're gonna end up. More information than you want. <laughs>
But it's, yeah, I mean, and I think part of it is that uh, because I am working intuitively, like before I used to always do these drawings, of, and then from the drawings I'd, I'd build a shot list of all the body parts that I needed to photograph, and then after I made the contact sheets, then I'd build um, a list of all the negatives that I needed to print in the dark room, and then I'd methodically try to reconstruct based on the drawing. And I'm just not like working that way anymore. Like I'm really um, trying to be um, more receptive to chance and also um, more fluid in the work. <laughs> yeah. In your pieces with the body, you use language to strongly pull and direct where the person looked to me. But in your new pieces, you still use no um, tactics to control where people look, but yeah. you stay away from language entirely. Right. Right. Uh, do you think that language has a place in controlling where the eyes look in such detail flies, or do you do that other way? Um, I want to bring language back. Like I'm, still, I'm still trying to figure out how to bring text back into my work, because I think that there's something really interesting about it reading language and reading images simultaneously. And then, and then the other thing, I mean, this is my experience as a viewer. Like when I encounter work that's text and image simultaneously, like I'm always trying to figure out, okay, which am I privileging right now? Do I read the text first or am I reading the image first? Or is, is there some way of getting an impression of both at the same time? Um, and then I just, I like, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm always talking about reading a photograph. So I like the idea of like literally having to read the text in a photograph. So um, I think that, I mean, one thing about this is I am, I'm really, I guess this, this is also goes back to answering this question about um, the process of making these pieces. I pin them on the wall and um, the thing that I'm interested in is the eye being actively charged as it's moving through these pieces. And if multiple days in a row I enter my studio and I find a different path to look through the photograph, I, I count that as a success. But if I look at it the same way every single day, then I feel compelled to rework it. So um, yes, like I'm really trying to create these paths, but I want the path to be um, to to be mutable, to like change. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, just to follow up on that, yeah. uh, can you do that with words? Do I do that with words? Can you do that with words? Because yeah. aren't, aren't we sort of programmed to see the same sequence of words? Mm -hmm. Or that's your challenge? Well, that, I think that's why I love those Emily Dickinson envelopes so much. Because she's writing in multiple directions, and so there is this opportunity to read the words in different ways and in different patterns. I mean, I can't stop thinking about that book. It's so great. I highly recommend it. It's 25 bucks on Amazon. And it has such a great title, The Gorgeous Nothings. I mean, that's a brilliant title. Yeah. What was your decision to go to like 3D? Oh. Huh. And do you, like, what kind of challenges do you find for uh, 2D versus 3D? Yeah, that's a really interesting. Okay, first of all, um, I'm not that comfortable with 3D, and so maybe that's why I'm interested in trying to explore it. But also, um, what the unfortunate thing about seeing these things documented is you can't really see um, <coughs> the physical layers that are involved. So they feel um, more dimensional when you see them in person. Like you can see the actual layers woven together. Um, okay, and then another thing. There are a couple of different things that are kind of like happening simultaneously. Um, my husband and I take pottery classes on Saturday, on Sundays. And so I'm working 3D in clay, and um, I found that um, some of the decisions that I'm making in clay, because I'm doing lots of carving into it, um, I want to figure out ways that I can translate them into the photographs. And then another thing is, I'm in this critique group, and there's a woman that's in the critique group that keeps telling me that they need to get three-dimensional. And I didn't, I was like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But then um, I saw that the kinds of papers that I like to work with, I need to work with a paper that um, can handle a lot of handling because I, I touch them a lot and I'm cutting into it, so the surface needs to be strong. 
So they just started making this double-sided luster paper that can really withstand the abuse that I put to it. So I thought, okay, so this is meant to be. I'm meant to print on both sides. Because before I was thinking, you know, I'd have to make my own laminate, and I just didn't, I thought that that would not be very good looking. So I kind of, I kind of like this idea of things being a little bit more seamless, you know, it's like, and now I'm thinking about how there's really no front end or back. And also, so this is the other really weird thing, I'm trying not to use any adhesives. So it's all kind of like cutting and intersecting things. So it's, I mean, it's just, you know, like it's this, uh, I'm charged with another puzzle to try to figure out. Which is kind of exciting, because it's like totally unfamiliar terrain. And kind of scary. But I think it'll be okay. Like right now, there's little pieces that look a little bit too much like um, Christmas, Christmas ornaments, you know, like jeans. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I'm gonna jettison that very soon. But again, you know, you kind of got to start with what's familiar and then stake a larger territory. Any other questions? Kind of? No. I'll meet our guests. Spend 15 minutes talking to our guests first. Okay.